our first presenter, the esteemed Mr. David Kane, uh, is uh, from LA. He works in uh, architecture themed environments, commercial music videos, mostly in front of the camera, right? Yeah. Always, yeah, okay, great. Uh, Fox, ABC, NBC, Warner Brothers, Universal, David does it all. Uh, he is here to talk to you about approaching music programming on EOS. David. Yeah, totally used to being on this side of things. Um, yeah, so I'm here just to talk about basic approaches, kind of the 15,000 foot view of how I approach, and I think a lot of us share similar approaches of how we start uh, music on EOS. So I thought I'd start with a quote. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> right, so um, this is more, so much of it is conceptual, and I think when you talk to people about it, there's like a lot of hang up of like what buttons to push and where you put it, and so much of it is like how you approach it and how you mentally compartmentalize it. So I kind of wanted to try to take some of the um, mystique out of that. Because, um, you know, so when I'm approaching a show, things I often have at my disposal, I have my laptop running Nomad, um, I can sit and I can think about a show, coffee, so I can stay up late and think about it. Because um, when I get on site, I know that I won't have a lot of this. Um, I do a lot of one-offs, mainly for film and television. Um, and if I hear the song ahead of time, before I get to site, that's awesome. Um, if, you know, if, hopefully I'll know what the rig is and I'll be able to prep a show file, but uh, you know, it kind of depends on how things go. So I can do actually a lot before I even get to site, and I, it's kind of, I try to build these show files up before I get there. So things I can do without leaving my couch, right? I can, I can patch my show and create my groups, so I usually try to set myself up for success by grouping them by fixture or by position and creating different offsets so that when I'm applying these effects on the fly um, or with very limited time to build these you know, Q to Q base, these Q to Q bases, I, I have places to start from. Um, a lot of times I'll build my starter palettes. Um, I have some macros to help me do this. Um, but I also, you know, if I've worked with shows, you know, there are lights I've never worked with before, I will totally punt and use the color picker from my couch. Or the, I like using the EO standard colors. So red, you know, blue. And I find if I use that across all of my lights, because the color, the color system's so good, it gets them in a ballpark. And sometimes I end up tweaking them on site, and sometimes I don't, but I have a way to say, I want to make those lights red right now, and I don't have to worry that I'm going to hit that button and nothing's going to happen. Um, I do the same thing with ML controls, uh, as far as beam palettes and basic zoom palettes and stuff like that. I'll build my magic sheets, um, pixel maps. Um, I'll also know ahead of time if I have blinders or strobes or special effects like cryo blasts and stuff in my rig. Um, I always like having inhibs for those too, because um, those are problematic on camera. Um, so I know I'm going to need that stuff, so I can prep that before I even get there. Um, Familiarize with what I have. If there are lights I haven't worked with before, uh, make sure I look up a manual. I know what they can do. Um, ML controls is awesome for this because I can just kind of spread everything out and kind of fan through. Oh, cool. It's got three gobo wheels and two of them rotate. Good to know. And uh, I started thinking of what I'd like to do with these lights, right? So I look them up. I say, oh, cool. They'd be good to do this instances. Um, prepping your show file, it's like building a toolbox, right? I have a, this toolbox and I go to work every day and I bring these tools with me from show to show to show. So I have all of this stock content that I'll bring with me, and I, it lives in a base show file, and it's stock effects and stock palettes, um, and places for me, to, for me to start to get me up and running really quick. Because a lot of my life is, I need to get something up right now, and then hopefully have time to hone it in and make it art. Um, so this is like what my focus palette page looks like. Typically it comes in and it's you know, blank like this, and I pop. this is one thing I do have to do on site, because that's kind of hard to kind of do before you get there. Um, there are a lot of base palettes that you end up using. Um, and this is pretty standard for, I think, most of us. Um, you know, you have your cross positions and your, your straight positions and your fanned positions and a lot of these just very standard aerial beam things. Uh, again, color palettes. I try to keep it pretty simple. Really, you only need 10. I'm a little heavy uh, with about 17. And then I have varying shades of white because I do TV. Um, but it's, a, you know, it's about being able to jump quickly between them, but because these are all also built into my stock effects. I, don't, I personally don't like having you know, 20,000 colors because I, just, I can't manage it. Um, all of my palettes are always by type, uh, and I have a very interesting and complicated macro system to manage that quickly and on the fly. But this way, if I've seen a light before, I already know I have palettes for it. I don't have to, you know, I don't have to worry, oh, cool, I've seen this, you know, I've seen this light before, I'm busking with... Um, you know, solar spots. Uh, I know, I've seen these lights, I've got color palettes for them. I've already approved these at some point in my life. I don't need to revisit them. 
Um, this is kind of what, again, what my effects page looks like. I, you know, I kind of break it up into intensity, focus, color, and beam effects. A lot of times, my life is I roll in with a, a geo or a TI, and I just I plop it on a table and I go. Like if I get external monitors, it's a great day. Um, so I've kind of condensed my life to live on everything I touch is on one monitor, everything I see is on another monitor. Um, because a lot of times there's just not time. We're going in for a commercial and there's a big, you know, a big concert setup or whatever. It's just like they don't want to wait for you to rig all the arms and do all the stuff. It's just like get in, start programming immediately. Um, all of my effects, uh, my intensity effects are all linear. Um, so you can see here it's all drawn above the line and I go, I stick with it's kind of a, this, uh, the idea of four types of effects, the step effect, uh, the wave effect, the ramp effect, and the burst effect. Uh, and I use, I use linear effects because I can also, on the fly, edit them from the ESD. So, oh, I want more dramatic, I can dial that up or dial that down, um, where I don't always have that flexibility with absolute effects. So I like to use those uh, types of effects for that. All my color effects, um, those are absolute effects, and I, I use a color over a background state. So I never, I don't have any two color effects in my show because I want a red and blue effect, red effect over blue lights. I want a green and white effect, green effect over white lights. I, so it minimizes the amount of combinations that I have to make. And I can, it means I can apply anything over an existing look and it kind of looks like it belongs. Um, again, this is kind of my focus and I think it's pretty self-explanatory there on the, on the left, kind of what they all do. Um, I also, you know, I tend to build macros. I have a lot of these that move from me to sh with me from show to show to show. These are like some basic ones, especially on EOS. And again, a lot of times I have one console, no fader wing. Um, so I found very useful ones for me to have is a fader page and shift fader page on these bottom two macro keys down here. Next, right, next fader page and last fader page. And I can just pop through it if I need to. Um, if you're working with time code and stuff, that, that stuff's, um, sorry, some fanning stuff that I use all the time, I'll keep on the buttons. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Okay, so <laughs> I would love to say that everything I do is art. And it's hard like, to not want to get in there and make these things of beauty. And a lot of, times, like, a lot of times you walk away and you're like, yeah, I nailed that. And sometimes you're like, you know what? I survived. And the first rule is you got to get it done, okay? No one wants, you know, oh, wow, the, well, the, the first verse and a half were beautiful. I mean, you know, then we kind of just sat in the same look for the rest of the song. Um, so, you know, usually what I'll do is I'll lay in the structure and then as I have time, I'll go and finesse. If it's one song, I might have more time. If it's five or six songs, I probably won't have as much. Um, I also am a big fan of out, outsourcing or outboarding things like accents and bumps or little, little hits. You know, if I want, you know, one light each to hit on a, a beat, you know, instead of building that into my master cue stack, it's going to be easier for me to make a separate cue stack with those few things on them and then just remember to hit that in time because it's, it takes out a lot of that organizational structure of building these cue stacks and then stuff kind of moves around. Yeah, keep it simple, okay? So when you're laying this in, don't, I find, especially if you have to work fast, it's not worth getting super fancy. Um, there's a time and a place for that, and if you have the time for it, that's great. Um, but again, rule number one, you've got to get something on stage, something the client's going to be happy with. Um, and you have to make sure it gets there. So keeping it simple. Macros are your friend. Uh, if you're doing something over and over and over and over and over again, record a macro for it. Um, I have hundreds and hundreds of macros in my show. Some of them do very simple things like fan center, enter, just so I don't have to. It saves me three button, button presses. Um, take the time to use the setup of the desk to your advantage. Um, I always set my default queue times. I like queue timings of zero because I find I do a lot of hits and bumps Except for focus, I'll usually keep focus at about two seconds because typically I, want, I don't want snap movements. Uh, set your sneak times, your back times. Um, I use home preset as a way, oh, they hung that light backwards. Instead of going and flipping it at the patch level, I'll just do it at a home preset and call it a day because it saves me that extra step of going into blind and dealing with that. Uh, and finally, I found this one to be really important um, and it's been a hard lesson to learn and I've learned it the hard way. Do nothing, stay ahead. Um, I have gone in, I've, oh, I'm going to get ahead and I'm going to lay in this cue structure. I kind of, I know what I want to do. And then you get there and, oh, well, we've changed the song or we've cut out a verse and a half or the bridge is no longer there. And now you're in this structure that doesn't fit what you're trying to do. Um, so I try to, you know, I'll write, I'll write it out on a cue list if I have a time externally on a piece of paper. But I try not to lay in cue lists and stuff ahead of time. 
I just find that tends to get me in trouble. Um, I also tend to limit my options, right? So, you know, here are kind of the base color palettes that are, you know, you, you probably want to start with. Um, I like the base, you know, the colors of the rainbow, uh, and then a white and CMY because, you know, uh, CMY lights. Uh, I do have varying shades of blue because I work in TV, and as someone said earlier today, TV is very sensitive to blue, so I, I do, I'm a little heavier in my shades of blue. Um, so yeah, so this is kind of what I use as my base, my base palettes and stuff. Um, when we get on set, um, time management is key. This is, again, kind of what my palette, my, my music setup and, and busking um, palettes look like. So I like to program the music, whether it's cue to cue or whether it's busking. Um, I like to think of it as cooking, right? And I'm not the first one to make this analogy, um, but I'm going to use it because I think it's a really good one. Uh, note you want to cook, right? What are we setting out to accomplish? Like, what is my idea for the song? Is it a right? Is it a rock song? Is it a power ballad? Are we doing a ballet? Is it a high school dance recital? Is it you know what are we doing? There are different levels of what we're trying to accomplish. Um, I always like to take the time and prep the ingredients, right? It's it's a lot easier to cook when you say, oh, okay, my onions are cut and my and I've got my salt and my pepper here. And if I'm building these things as I'm going, you're going to way slow yourself down. Think of what you're going to need. Prep it in advance so you can just grab it when you need it, and you can just combine all of these, these looks uh, that you've kind of prefabbed into, into what's going on on stage. Um, this is uh, set up your mise en place. Um, it's in place, yeah. Uh, so basically, put things where you can find them. If you have one touch screen, put your direct selects on the touch screen. Like, I know this seems like it's probably pretty obvious, but it's, it's surprising that, you know, I want, I'm right handed, so all of my direct selects live you know, right above my right hand, because I can go from, I can easily go from the keypad up to the, the direct selects, and it's just very easily, you know, I know where to find them, they're in the same place. Every show, I never have to hunt for anything. Um, the stuff that I want isn't hidden in other tabs, it's always up front, and I use snapshots to manage that to my advantage as well. Um, don't mix, you know, don't get too fancy with your colors. There's kind of a generally accepted rule, two colors, right, generally. White counts as one of your colors. Um, there are rare exceptions, as has been pointed out to me, but generally speaking, this is a good place to start. You can't really go wrong with only two colors. You can't, you can't be too offensive. And then it always allows you to have a white on a bump button for some accents and stuff, and that's always a good place to go. Uh, and finally, give yourself room to work. Um, so again, offboarding these items, um, such as bumps and hits and accents, um, so that you don't end up with this long cue stack that you're trying to sort through. Um, my cue stacks typically only have five parts to them. Uh, so first, I'm always going to have a base, right? So I'm going to have like a blue outlook or a base look on which I'm building over um, so that if I end up dumping stuff, the stage doesn't go dark. Um, so if I'm in an awards you know, show scenario or, some, you know, or there's a live band on stage, it's someplace for me to come from and go to, right? So I'm never coming from a black stage. I'm always coming from something that's lit. And it's always underneath. So I can always assert that at the end of the show and use that to stomp out uh, other looks that I have on stage. Um, and then I'll have my main song looks, and like I said, it's usually five looks, right? I'll have an intro, a verse, which I'll recycle, a chorus, which I'll recycle, a, a, a bridge, and then my button look, which is the, you know, the big at the end, and usually everything flies out and ends up in a single color or white or wherever it is. Um, typically, I'll put a stop all flag on that because I don't want, you know, the big end and it, the band has stopped, but you still have like the circle effects and the color chases going. <laughs> Um, so I like to like make sure that I put a stop all flag on that. So it's just like, okay, I know if I get to that, that cue is going to assert uh, and it's going to stop everything from moving. Uh, and finally, uh, this I stole from a very talented programmer named Zach Manasso, um, the hot sauce, right? It's all the stuff that's over here that I can just hit and, you know, just add spice to it as I'm going. So even if I didn't think of it as the time, I know, oh, I always have the here are the blinders, and here are the strobe lights, and here are, here's a bump to white, and this allows me to run that, you know, a temporary color chase on that back, that back, uh, back psych or those back lights or whatever. Um, you can take it with you. That's kind of the cool thing about this is as you go and you start to build up these show files. Hit go. No? Okay. Um, so the more shows you do, the easier it gets because your, your, your show files start to, you know, snowball. You get the snowball effect of, oh, cool, I did this one thing on this show, and I'm going to take it to my next show. Um, if you build your shows in module fashions by using things like bi-type palettes um, and a lot of stuff that is channel agnostic, it's really easy just to port from one to the next to the next to the next. Um, figure out numbering conventions that work for you and stick with them, right? 
My color palettes are in the 200s. My, you know, I, I, I have everything in specific places so that I know how to find them easily. Um, and finally, be, be organized. Organization is key. Um, you know, everything I have is very specifically numbered in a specific place. It's easy to find. Um, it makes a lot of sense to me, at least, when I look at it. And hopefully, if I set up a show and I'm sick and someone comes in, they can easily figure out how it's set up and how it's laid out. Um, and EOS is actually a really good desk for this because it's very easy to look at and kind of get an overview of what's going on right away. And finally, familiar, know the desk. And I can't emphasize this enough, especially if you want to do any sort of music that you don't have time for, where you just go in and you do it. Um, understand the core concepts and expected behaviors. Right? I hit this button, I know what's going to happen. I hit the go on this cue list and I have three other things going, I know how that's going to interact with all these other playbacks. Um, also, face panel buttons, what they all do and where to find them. Because nothing will slow you down more than this. Um, yeah, again, how, how these playbacks interact. And also, uh, in 2.5 and coming in 2.6, like so many awesome new fader options and button options. Uh, it's, you know, familiarize yourself with them, understand what they do, how they work together, and how you can use them to your advantage. Um, it's just, it's kind of revolutionized the way we can, are able to busk on EOS. It's just made it such a joy. Um, and finally, I'll end with one more quote. All right, so just go out there and do it. It's practice, practice, practice. The more you do it, the easier it gets, the more fun it is because you're not as stressed out because you can focus on what you're doing. Um, thank you guys very much. Uh, so I'm going to bring up uh, Ziggy. Uh, Ziggy is an expat uh, living in uh, London now. Um, you have worked at the National Theatre and the National Ballet in London. Uh, Olympics on NBC, BBC Sports, Formula and Racing. Um, you'll get there, kid. Like you, you'll you'll do some you'll do some stuff soon. <laughs> one so days. one day. Uh, and so Ziggy is going to talk to you about uh, busking for unusual events. Cool. So yeah, one of the things I thought that I could talk about uh, that would be bringing something a little bit different to the table is that I do super, super weird production, <laughs> like really strange stuff. So I am really often finding myself in a place where like, I have no idea what the costumes are supposed to mean. I don't know where we are. I do not know what language is being spoken or sung in. I have no idea what's going on. So. I have a lot of shows where I may or may not have heard the music before, but I still have no clue what's going on for one reason or another. And that means that I've got some tools that are important to me for different scenarios uh, that are a little bit unusual. So for instance, uh, in a lot of the scenarios where I have not heard the music before, I'm walking into a room where I am not even sure what the show is about. And my favorite thing to use for this and lots of other situations is the query button. So anybody who knows me and the way I program knows that I am like a query fiend. I love everything about query. And it allows me to select a lot of fixtures without knowing where they are in the air, where they come from. All I have to do is have been in patch at one point or another and told the desk what they are. And the way I like to think of that is like I'm a doctor, a surgeon, and I'm asking somebody like scalpel, 40 cc's of awesome. I ask for this <laughs> stuff and it just gives it back to me. I have to be in patch anyway, right? If the fixture is there, I will have had to go into patch at some point. It's something I can prep, I can prep it in Lightrite, I can prep it in a CSV, I can do it on the desk on the day. If the fixture is there, I will have had to be in patch at some point. So I might as well put the text labels in there somewhere. And then I can ask for that stuff back without having to do any extra work. My query stuff is generally all macro-based, and those don't have to change. I can leave those query macros in place on some nice magic sheets, and I can allow those query macros to grab consistently labeled text fields. Stage left, stage right, upstage, backlight, front light, profiles, fresnels. Which means that the structure of my shows tends to be really, really, really specific in the patch area. So my patch stuff is really detailed. I don't leave any dimmer stuff. Everything I patch is a Fresnel or a Profile or a Practical or Chandelier, stuff that you can find if you don't have that already inside the generic ETC manufacturer of stuff. 
And I try to keep those text labels to a consistent minimum so that I can keep my query macros in place pretty easily. But it does me a world of good for all kinds of performance, but especially for ones where I don't know what's happening. It's a one-off. I don't know these numbers. I'm not really sure where this is coming from. It helps me out a lot. So for instance, <laughs> this was too good to leave out. The job that I am going to, when I fly back home from here, I got, it's in this studio. There's a picture of the studio that I've done some stuff in before. This is the kind of thing that we do in there. I got this picture this morning. That's all I'm going to get. That's it. I've got that picture. I've got a PDF manual of that fixture that I've never used before. It's, it's a kind of blade. I've got some useful structures and macro structures that group blades and pixels for me. I always, like all of us do, separate out a head fixture from pixels. And then I use those pixels, lots of macros that create groups for me that are in, in pixel order. I always text label in my patch. And I have macros that do this. Don't worry, I don't do it on a little individual basis. But I have macros that label pixels in one of the text fields as pixel one, and another text and for the next pixel as pixel two, all in, say, text field 10. And then I can query for pixel one, pixel two, pixel three. I know I'm going to have to use that here. I don't know what the DMX arrangement of those pixels is yet. <laughs> I just know I'm going to have to use that. So when I find out what the DMX arrangement of those pixels is, I will use my macros to apply pixel one or pixel two to the text field 10 of those fixtures. And then all my stuff is going to work after that, because all my stuff is based on that. So that's literally all I've got. And I know that about an hour after I show up, they're going to expect something like this. <laughs> And I'm going to have to get there somehow. <laughs> I'm going to have to make that happen for them. And there are some things that will help me get to the wow factors of that. The querying for text stuff, that's pretty practical. That's stuff that will allow me to grab the channels and the fixtures that I need. But then i got to do something with them. So what I do with them, a lot of it has to do with rate of stuff. So rates, BPMs of effects. Those things are really, really useful to me. And that includes manual timing stuff. So all of this timing stuff, I like to keep in some nice little timing magic sheets. I need to be able to change rates quickly. I need to be able to change BPMs quickly. 2.6 software really helps me out with that. I can macrotize a lot of things that I, didn't, I wasn't able to macrotize before. And I can change things with nice, clean magic sheet buttons. I can have solid BPM buttons. I tend to try to keep a lot of BPMs in place because I deal with a lot of classical music. And classical music has really common BPMs associated with different kinds of performance. So a lot of the unusual performance I'm doing, I'm watching. I am sitting watching, say, this quartet. Well, it's a Coney Quartet. And I am listening to them improvise music. They have rehearsed. I've heard them rehearse before. And I've practiced with their rehearsal improvisation but I don't actually know what they're going to play. I don't know. What I do know, because I know them and I've seen their rehearsals, is I know what they look like <laughs> when they are about to ramp up. I know when someone pulls back, I know that they're going to speed up when they go forward again in a minute. And I've got to pay super, super close attention to that, really close attention. And then I can apply ready a BPM that I think is appropriate or a rate equally useful, in a percentage value that applies to what the music is doing. So I'm listening. I'm taking notes down every once in a while, because I think I might know when a repetition is going to come up as well. And I'll see one of those players, especially the, the violinist who's very forward leading in the music. I know that because I've seen the rehearsals. He draws back his bow, and I can see him ready to lean into something. And I am ready with a Vivace BPM. So I'm ready, waiting for that to happen, because I've seen it. I also tend to categorize magic sheet buttons in those orders when I'm doing opera or any kind of classical genre. I have things grouped in musical notation. So I'll end up having some moderato buttons. They might include effects, as well as rates and sizes of things. Things that I think are appropriate for that style of, of play. So that's a very specific thing, but it's very, very useful to me. I feel when I'm doing this stuff a lot more like a light pianist than a programmer. 
And for me, those things are really, really, really integrated, and it's the kind of stuff I love to do. So I really feel like I am a performer. I have to breathe with them. I have to know what they're doing. I have to feel the music, and I'm improvising just like they are. And I have my tools, just like they do. They have their notes, they have their bow, they have their instrument. I've got my EOS. I've got my subs that have different effect rates on them. I've got my buttons. I know what I'm typing in. But I have to watch them and breathe with them and feel what they're doing. And when you have a quartet or an orchestra, if you have a conductor to look at, if you've got a lead on one of the instruments, you can feel with them. And you can help support that performance in a really, really, really special way. This is the kind of stuff I just love to do. So another kind of performance that I do is where I have heard the music before, but I still don't know what's going on. And <laughs> that happens more often than I'd like to think. That might be because stuff is split up in really weird locations, physically. It might be because I do not know if someone is going to accost an audience member during this thing. So I was doing this opera in Beijing, and we had a bit of a promenade space going on. It's a limited space, but this guy, particular concern during opera, you have the dreaded recit. Performers during opera in a recit are allowed to adopt normal speech patterns rather than music. So I have heard this song before many, 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 many times. We've rehearsed it all the way till the cows come home. But he sings it really, really, really differently every time because he's allowed to adopt normal speech patterns as part of the recit. I have to be really careful listening. <laughs> Just like I watch a conductor and I'm watching when they're leaning into something, I'm watching when they pull back, I'm waiting to run with their rate, with their size. I have to watch and listen to him and fire off the right thing at the right time based on what he says. And often that opera is not in a language that I speak because I do a lot of opera in a breadth of languages. I do a lot of experimental opera that occurs in languages that are not Italian, English, or German. So I have a lot of tools that allow me to quickly run with his pace. And usually that's about splitting up content into sort of standalone run, run stuff. Much like in any other kind of live music situation, you might have a bass cue and stuff you fire on top of it. In this kind of performance, I very often have a bass recit look and stuff that I fire on top of it as I hear him say it. Because I'm not sure what kind of emphasis and order he's going to use. So I have to be pretty careful with that as well. I also use a lot, so this is a, lots of text query labels and magic sheets. Um, I like to be sort of mean to like lighting designers and uh, DOPs, tell them where to look for stuff. Uh, those magic sheets and text labels help me find things really, really, really quickly, especially if they're in weird spaces or locations. So this is a very, very simple magic sheet that's just got the two spaces. I can't see those two rooms at once. I have people in each room on radio to me telling me what needs to happen in that room. But I do not have a shot of that. I don't have eyes on it. So when someone says, hey, over radio, can I have that thing behind the door? I don't even know which room they're talking about. I've got multiple stages. I have multiple sets going on. I have an inhibit per room. I would inhibit per set, this is actually three rooms. I can pick the thing behind the door, and I can even query for practical or special door, and I can ramp that down quickly. If someone tells me that I need to lose a space, I can lose a space on the inhibit. When I have separate spaces like this, I also keep things really, really, really heavily magic sheeted and partitioned. So a thing that I do a lot with sets especially if I have rooms like this, I'll take a picture, it's like of this one, of the set, and I will create invisible bounding boxes over the top of the picture. So in these unusual spaces, you usually have pieces of set that people refer to in a myriad of hilarious ways. And you might have 10 pieces of LED strewn about a room. You've got LED in the desk, you've got LED in the doorway, you have a thing that's triggered by a pressure mat that somebody steps on in an immersive experience. And there are so many bits. There is no way that you're going to remember those numbers. There is just no way, especially when you're moving between rooms. So taking a picture of the thing and putting invisible boxes over the top of it so that I can click the picture that I'm looking at is incredibly useful to me. And I also pair that with a lot of remotes. 
So when I have separate rooms, I was controlling all of these rooms at once. I had a band going on in one stage. I had an entrance hall that had some audience effects running in another stage. I had a show that happened to be Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas running underground all of this stuff. And I had a bar that I had control over. It's like a lot of stuff. A lot of stuff. A lot of really different stuff. Different effects needed in each one. Fear and Loathing was a performance that was a play. I needed a cue stack to run in that room. In the entrance hall, I needed effects to be running over the top of this like nice installation for audience entrances, little atmosphere stuff. I had a band going on in one of the rooms that needed bumps and fades and all of those busking materials that normal live music does. And I have a bar that just needs to like, you know, drunk people need to like. That all takes a lot of different tools. I cannot tell you how important it is that your numbering systems are consistent and that they work for you. Because this is a lot of work. To keep everything separate, I partition that within an inch of its life. I have macros that change my partition. I have partitions that narrow down to just the stage, partitions that narrow down to the bar, to the room underneath in the theater, the entrance hall, and all the other rooms involved in this show. I have partitions that narrow me down to just the architectural features of all of those rooms, and partitions that give me all of the moving lights in all of the rooms. I do that stuff with partitions so that I can give myself really quick overriding access to things, and also limit other people's access to things. Make sure I don't step on my own numbering systems. But you can't partition content. So I try to limit my content with really, really, really clear numbering systems to very specific locations. I might have beam palettes 100 through 500 assigned to that room, beam palettes 500 through 1,000 assigned to another room, and I have to stick to that stuff. So my macros that change my partition to the right room also drop me into snapshots that change me to the right buttons for that room. So I have a lot of snapshots, a lot of partitions, a lot of macros that keep me in the right place for the right space, because otherwise I've got no chance. I have to make sure that stuff is super split up. So it's a lot of work to begin with, but hopefully those things are consistent. Because I do such different kinds of shows, I need a slightly different basic show file structure than a lot of other people use. What I have are different show file templates. So I've got a basic live music template, a basic commercial television template, opera, Ballet, touring theater, static theater, rep theater. All of those things have their own individual show file. There's a template, Ziggy Opera Basic 2016. And I merge in stuff to each one of those template show files from a larger library resource file. The library resource file contains way more stuff. And I'm starting to split that into more specific ones. But what I'm trying to do with a single library resource file and different show file templates is cover the needs of all of this really weird stuff without overwhelming any one of them or causing myself any extra work trying to delete stuff that I don't need. And with the single library resource file, I'm trying to have a consistent amount of things that I can draw from and realistically, I'm not gonna merge back like I should all of the stuff that I like into five different library files. I need one library file, so if I like when I get home and I do this show at the end of the week, if I like what I did with those blades, if I like those color palettes, if I like some beam palettes that I made or some movement effects, I'll merge that back into the library resource file, ready to be drawn from, maybe put into my commercial television show next week, or maybe put into a live music show file the following week. And I'll pull from that single library resource file and keep it in whatever template I need for that show. But it means that stuff has to be really, really, really consistently numbered so that I never step on one piece of content with another, and overwrite stuff. So you gotta be pretty careful. There's one other thing that's really, really important to me when I'm doing this kind of weird performance. So I'm looking at a conductor, I'm looking at musicians, I've gotta do a lot of walking between rooms, I usually need remotes. So I'm walking around with perhaps a Nomad. I might even have that, and I have a, a, a flippable Lenovo Yoga tablet. So it's got a keyboard, it's a laptop, I flip it into being a tablet, and I walk around with my Nomad, and I walk into the bar, and I plug it in 
to my switch that's in the bar, and I program from there. I'm not leaving a console in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't want to leave the console in the bar. I put a switch in there, I bring my yoga tablet, I walk into the room, plug it in, do my programming, unplug it, leave, go to another room, plug it in, do my programming there, leave it. That's also useful in a single set promenade environment where I'm walking around a set that is immersive, it might be a specialist style performance. I need to be able to walk into different areas of this split up room and I need to be able to program stuff that I can see there. Walk over, plug in, program the stuff that I can see, unplug it, my master is still on the, on the network, keeping all of this stuff together. And I bring that into the different spots, program where I can see it, and then unplug it without having to leave a console there. Really, really, really useful. We don't recommend wireless nomad usage necessarily. I do do it, but, you know, things happen. I like having those little remotes as well. I have IRFR stuff that I walk around with, but for total programming, I like having a switch in each room, walk in, plug into the switch, do the programming and leave. I'm really excited about all of the OSC box stuff because I love having that. I could leave in the bar. No one will even know what it does. I could just put it up on the wall. I could do some little things. It'd be great. Can't wait. Last but not least, there's a lot of standing involved in this. So just get some nice gel pads for your shoes. <laughs> Like, my feet hurt right now. I didn't bring them with me. Like, if you're going to do all this standing, looking at stuff, going over, like, the mezzanine level of something, trying to watch a violinist pull his arm back and doing, like, ah, click, you really just need to be comfortable. <laughs> so make sure that you take care of yourself, have some water, put some gel pads in your shoes, and have a good time. Thanks. Awesome. I could go for those gel pads right about now. <laughs> those conference room floors are the best. Um, so Ryan Phillips is the programmer for The Daily Show. Uh, he does things with CBS, Dick Clark's Rockin' New Year's Eve, NFL Today, uh, the New York City Ballet, West Point. And, and Ryan is going to first take you through just uh, a little bit of setup that he does. Uh, and, and then he's going to busk, and, and kind of like David said, he's, he's going to be awesome or he's not, and then and it'll be over regardless. Um, <laughs> not, not, <laughs> Ryan's going to do an awesome job for you guys. Uh, so, uh, Ryan Phillips, take it away, buddy. <laughs> anyway, we're just going to look at, this is a file that I built based off of my show file. So, it's just kind of got some of the stuff that I would normally use. Um, and this is basically the layout that I'm going to show you. On one screen, I have layouts of the rig, right, with groups and offsets and macro buttons that change my magic sheet views to go to so static fixture layout, a moving light layout, a blade layout for pixels and stuff like that, um, and then just some general presets if I want to store stuff on the fly, and some general beam palettes. Uh, I'm going to be doing this in the style of basically a festival where I'm not recording things. I'm running everything on manual data. I'm taking things out with inhibitive subs and things like that. My inhibitive subs are basically by fixture type and then one that does all of them. Okay? And that's the moving light layout and the one for the pixels. You see it's already running in effect. I'll talk a little bit about my structure, uh, how I organize my file to get to things quickly. I have five snapshots in my show, and that's it. All they do is set up my file and my tabs on what screens they, they go to. The snapshots are one screen through five screens. That's it. Okay? Everything else is tab location based. And I have an organizer on my right internal that lives there all the time. It never changes, and it just is a basically a paging structure. Okay. Underneath it, I have my effects pages. Um, I only put a few of all the effects in it just to save time <laughs> and energy. All the effects are basically copies of each other, just with grouping, with different grouping of each. It goes from spread to four, and that's usually plenty. Uh, in my file, I usually take it out to eight 
and then a ninth with the custom. And so I'll have intensity effects, color effects, focus effects, beam, and beam effects. All of my color effects are uh, based off of their absolute effects using my 30 color palettes. That's it. I only have 30 color palettes. And David said he had 10. 17. I go a little bit farther with 30. It's enough for what I do. Uh, anyway, uh, I guess I'll just get into it and hope I don't screw this up. <laughs> All right. This is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. <laughs> much for that. Uh, you know, to, to do live broadcast uh, in front of, of millions and millions of people is a lot, but to, to do a busking demo in front of a, a room full of lighting people, uh, that <laughs> takes some, take some big encoders, so. Um, okay. Um, so, we're going to invite the illustrious Mr. Josh Seelander up. <laughs> Josh is a, a former etc -er, and we like him still anyway. Um, uh, he currently teaches at North Carolina School of the Arts. He just uh, did Chris Angel's Mind Freak Live in Vegas. Uh, if you're familiar with it, four or five movers maybe? Six. Six, okay, well, that's good, it's good. So even numbers, right? we don't use odd numbers. Um, uh, also, uh, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Humanity, 
uh, several Broadway shows, uh, the, the ever charming and ever handsome Josh Sealander. Uh, so I'm going to actually switch it up a little bit, and instead of uh, talking about busking, I'm actually going to talk about time code and just general cue playback. So the very first question that I typically ask when I am asked to do a time coded piece is I just I immediately stop because before I go any further, when I do a show with time code, there's one question that's very 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 important, and that's has the time code been locked? Meaning. Are they going to add 30 seconds of time code into the middle of the show after you've already done it? Or is the video done? Is the audio done? Is everything ready for you to actually show up and start working uh, with the lighting? So the very first thing that I always want to make sure of is, is it locked? And what's the frame rate? Those are the two things that no one ever talks about when they ask you to time code. But you want to know what the frame rate is because you want to know if your show's gonna actually play back. That's the whole purpose of it. So, um, next thing, you need to start listening to the music. Um, unlike most of the shows where you busk with time code, that's probably gonna last for a while. It's gonna be playing the same show over and over and over again, 10 times, 20 times a day, hopefully for 10 to 20 years. So that show is very likely going to be a very extensive programming process because they're going to want to pick up every single piece of music. They're going to want to hear every single instrument. They're going to want to hear every single instrument of every single moment of the show, and they're going to wonder why you didn't pick up that one violin or why you didn't pick up that one snare hit. And the downfall to that is that you probably didn't even notice it because there were 16 other things happening all at the same time, not to mention you were programming it in a room where there was a bunch of lifts, there was construction still happening, and you didn't really pay attention most of the time anyways because there was all these distractions happening in front of you. So the, the really difficult part about doing, for me, and, and doing time code or doing anything that's based on the idea of uh, consistent cue playback is you have to decide what it is that you know, is the most important part of each one of those pieces. Um, so if you have something that you, know, you have a standard beat that you can find, that you can hit that beat every single time, then that's probably what you want to start with. Okay? And then you'll start to layer additional instruments on top of that as you go through. Um, I think Ziggy and David have actually both mentioned, you don't need to go in and like have this amazing piece to begin with. You need to have some really base layers and you can eventually add more and more and more on top of it as you get through because it's probably gonna change from the moment that you show up in the theater until the time that you actually leave. Um, the one lesson that I've learned is that you should just stop listening to it on headphones. At a certain point, you're going to realize that what you're hearing on headphones when you're trying to learn the music is very different than what's actually in the theater, especially if you're an immersive venue where they have more than a stereo sound system. Most of these shows that I'm working on that do have an immersive experience, it's typically anywhere from a 7 to 30 or 40 um, uh, type of uh, Dolby system or um, some type of multi, um, multi-layer sound system. So there are pieces of that show that you may have never even heard in your headphones because they actually weren't in the mix that the audio designer gave you. So a lot of times I actually just stop listening to the music and I just want to know, hey, what, what kind of sound system are we actually using? Not that I would know what it means, but I actually want to know what is, it, what is the experience when we get there. So, um, for instance, we just uh, worked on a show at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and there were these butt kickers. We had no idea that there were butt kickers. They're these little things that vibrate underneath the seat and make you feel like you're in the middle of the show. Well, we should match something that goes with that with the, with the lighting to go with the audio. That doesn't show up in headphones. So there's a lot of moments that you can pick up that you'll never understand unless you're in the venue. And a lot of those you won't hear until well after, the, well after you've started. Um, so commit. <laughs> probably not going to work out well the first time you do it, but you have to do it. You have to just try. Is it going to keep playing? That's even better. We should have, probably should have looped it. Every show. Every show. Every show. 
Yeah, well, remember, it's going to last for 20 years. So, so you're going to try something. It's probably not going to work the first or second or third time that you do it. Uh, you're, gonna, you're going to have to do this and figure out a better... We're just going <laughs> to... Going to go back. Go back to here. <laughs> so... You're going to try to pick up this moment of the show. It's not going to work. You're going to think of some other idea. It's probably still not going to work. Just keep trying. And when you pick a moment of that, of that one instance of the show to pick up, that one audio moment, that one piece of music that you want to light, that you want to have this effect that goes left, right, in and out, whatever it is, you, you have to start it, but you also have to make sure that it finishes all the way. You have to have a way to get into it, and then you have to have a way to get out of that out of that moment. And even if you don't successfully get out of that moment, you need to do something to distract the audience to help you get out of that moment. So if you know that it's going to be a complete disaster going in or out, you have to have a way to get out no matter what. <laughs> so you need to have an exit strategy. You need to have some way that you can go from one moment to another moment Maybe not seamlessly, but at least have a way to get there. You have to look at your rig. You have to know the lights that you have in the system. You have to know, oh, I need to have a moment in the, in the show where we, we blast the audience with light, but I only have 12 lights front of house to do that with. Do they all have the same dimmer blade? Do they all have some, or some LED or some arc? You have to figure out what you can do because the last thing you want is to have that one moment where you blind the audience, but because you have a mixed use rig and some are LED and some are, are arc source, the LEDs are gonna flash and then half a second later, there comes everything else. It's not gonna look right. You have to figure out how do you deal with that. So what you end up doing is you actually have to redo everything and go back and pick different lights. So, can you remember it all? You have to start thinking about the way and the way you program and the way that you're going to pick your numbers or your fixtures or however you organize your data. You have to have it in a very consistent, as Ziggy has pointed out, a very, very consistent way. Because whatever you started with today is the way that you need to go ahead and finish it. You can't change the way that you're gonna organize data halfway through the process because you're not going to remember it. The hardest part is trying to pick a way to commit to doing one of these, uh, one of these projects. Most of the time-coded shows that I do, there's no operator, there's no console once I leave the job site. It's running off of an RPU. So there is no one to control it. So you have to pick something that's A, easy for you to understand, but B, also easy for someone else to walk into. And it's not easy if it's not consistent from the beginning of the show to the end of the show. So part of that is dividing data, thinking about how you're actually gonna start parsing out data from one thing to another. So when I work on some of the effects, I actually look at, because I am very sequential in the way that we'll start queuing, all of my queue numbers are going to be relative to the actual effect number. So that way I have an, a little bit easier of a time to keep up with the numbering system. And when the designer says to me, hey, can you grab that effect from Q34? It's probably effect 34. It makes it a little bit easier to remember. If there's an offset that's odd, it's probably gonna be 3401 or an even is 3402. So pick numbers or pick a way to do something that makes the most sense. Don't try to just start putting things in because it won't make sense by the end of the show, especially when you go back and redo it all because it wasn't good. Remember, a lot of things that you do are likely gonna be happy accidents, much like the guy that made post-it notes, okay? So you're going to probably pick a moment in the show or a moment in time coding something or a moment in doing any kind of music where you didn't expect it was going to work or you had to look up on stage for another part of the show that actually looked better for this part. So just remember that just because it wasn't intentional doesn't mean it's not good. Um, on a lot of these where you are actually um, programming with a console, you will have an operator. One of the things that I like to do is start laying out faders and pages before I even start. I wanna figure that out. Even though I'm not busking anything, I wanna assign pages and faders before I actually pick up any of the of the queuing, mainly because, um, for instance, on 
the, uh, on Zumanity or for Mind Freak Live, the fader pages change based on the act that we're in. So we wanna make sure that when we go to that act, we're actually macroing everything. So the operator never has to do anything manually. The snapshots all change on the screens, the faders all change. So if they ever have to run the show out of sequence, the show's automated at that point. They never have to deal with anything management-wise or playback-wise on the fly. Macros are the best thing in the world. Um, the amount of macros that we end up using in the desk and the uses for them is unheard of. Um, I know that at some point you'll hear some of us talk about the ridiculous macros that we all have. Um, there's so many use cases for why you would want a macro and what that macro can do. Um, it, it really is the easiest way to deal with some of the functions in the desk. In time code, there's no shortcuts really. Uh, so the easiest way to deal with some of these commands is by creating shortcuts yourself. Um, you have to have macros to do this or you're not going to be able to get through um, because you're gonna end up with a designer telling you, hey, can you take this up two frames, next queue up three frames. Um, okay, can we go back 10 queues? Can we go ahead and reset the clock and let's start it all over? So you have to be really quick about how you program these. Um, public or private? How do we deal with timing? Remember that part where I said that there's no one that ever cares about the show because, well, there's no operator. There's, there's just a technician that occasionally will hit the button to start the show or the show's automated by AV systems. So you have to make a choice. Do you wanna have all of your timing in the show be discrete? Do you want everything to be in part cues? Or is it a mixed bag? The way that I divide it is, do I need to remember it or do I not need to remember it? So a lot of times I'm gonna part it out. I wanna keep as many things in parts because like I said, the sound mix will probably change and you need to go back into it and you need to figure out really quick what that is, why it's there and how to change it. And if you have everything in the show that's being done with discrete data, it's gonna take a lot longer to do the research and figure out what that fan time was from this to this, even though you're probably gonna still do discrete time with fan, but uh, it takes a lot more time to research the data for discrete time than maybe just trying to make the focus have a delay of two seconds. Put those five lights in a separate part queue. So uh, the other thing that you wanna really think about in terms of time coding, you're gonna add a lot of cues in the middle of one and two. You should probably give yourself more than one or two cues in between them. Um, this is a prime example of what happened with us at the beginning of, of Mind Freak. What ended up was we thought, oh, we don't really need more than 10 cues in between an act, and we ended up needing 100 cues in between an act. So it, you have to give yourself enough space because there's nothing more annoying than seeing 0 0.12, 0 0.13, 0 0.14, 0 0.15. Give yourself space. The desk has a limitation, but it's unobtainable. <laughs> right? Uh, you, you never expect first time perfection. You're gonna do so many passes of this, and every time that you do a pass, you're gonna pick up something else that you can add into it. You're gonna pick up that one moment where you didn't even hear the music, or that one time when the producer came through and gave you all of these fresh ideas. So don't expect first time perfection. Uh, I love this new program. Um, I had a friend introduce me to this program a couple of months ago. It is absolutely amazing for dropping in time code markers. So what you can do is you can listen to the track, you can have your time code included in it also on a left or right channel, you can drop markers in, and then you can export this as a CSV into your, uh, into your computer. So what you're able to do is you can actually go in and predefine all of your time code events in a program where everything's resident and actually export it out to a pretty decent uh, spreadsheet. This is what I use when I travel. Um, I actually just bought all of this because I forgot it the other day. So uh, it's all on Amazon. You can get this for less than $60 altogether. Uh, the reason that you need this is you wanna be able to run time code yourself. You wanna be able to have the file from the sound designer. You wanna be able to run everything without relying on someone supplying you with an operator from sound or the AV company to mix everything. Um, you can basically do all of this by just encoding the time code, the SMPTE uh, track, into a left or right channel of the track. 
So one of the things that I've learned is that you don't want to put all of your eggs in one basket. Um, in terms of dividing data, we can talk about actual management of, of palettes and presets or effects, but one of the things that I've learned is that you don't want to put all of your events in the same list. So for this uh, specific instance, there's a part of MindFreak where we actually have uh, this, this large saw coming out. There is a moment where there's all these manual hits from a submasters. There's also time-coded cues. We could put all of that into one event list, but why would do that? It's gonna make it a lot harder to manage that. Let's say all of the sub hits need to happen two frames later. Well, now they're all mixed and mingled in with all of the cues. So divide manual hits or, or, or submaster hits differently than you would actually put in cue hits. It makes it a little bit simpler on the out. Um, remember, failure is an option. This is how we think we're all gonna act when it fails. Right? It's gonna be great. You're gonna hit the button. You're gonna know when all the cues happen because you've memorized the music. This is what's gonna happen. <laughs> You're not gonna memorize anything at that point. There's gonna be nothing that you can do other than just start mashing on things and you're not gonna know where to mash. So think about that. When you deal with time code and playback, manual playback, your operators need to have some sense of how they're going to run the show if time code fails. So label it, put scenes in, put notes in, do things in a way that make it easy for them to actually run the show if everything is a disaster. Because at some point with time code, you'll have that moment where they're saying, oh yeah, I'm sending time code, nothing's there. So every day when you come in, you should do a check. You should make sure that you're receiving all of your show control from the various departments because you don't want that, you don't, you don't want to be the monkey, so. <laughs> This thing we'll all take away from this is you don't want to be the monkey. Um, wise, wise words. Thank you, Josh. So, certainly not least, uh, but last, uh, Louis Melagrino um, is going to take us through a couple of good habits and programming tips. Uh, Louis comes from uh, ESPN Studios, MLB Network, Disney, CNBC, New York Stock Exchange, Lincoln Center. Um, before you come up, uh, uh, Louis and I have known each other for a long time, and... Uh, uh, he's a very busy man, you know, you can tell by his resume. So uh, Lewis got me a, a PowerPoint with just, just a lot of words, and I don't really like those, uh, so I put uh, a bunch of cats in it to make sure that he stayed on track. So... It is a cat raffle. Lewis, All right. know, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Um, yeah. So, uh, some good habits to have. Uh, let's see. Here we go. Do your home. <laughs> oh, you did. Oh, you did. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished. Just remember that. Um, <laughs> and I know where you sleep. All right, um, so do your homework. Watch TV, see live music, um, go to the theater, go to your local events, see what's going on out there. I pick up a lot of things by watching people do a lot of things wrong. Don't do those things. But if you don't go out there, if you don't get out there and see what's going on in the world, you won't get those ideas. You won't have the time to develop that. So no idea comes on its own, get out there. Uh, crack. <laughs> It gets worse, guys. I'm seeing before you do here. It's just like... <laughs> like I've ever worked out. <laughs> so, again, watch a performance and think about what they're doing and play along with it. I sit in my office often put the radio on and play along and figure it out and figure out an idea and work on my show file. Um, 
oh, it would be cool if I had this in my toolbox. Oh, it'd be cool if I had that in my toolbox. It's kind of hard to do it in the moment, but when I'm sitting on the couch watching TV and my, my laptop's open with Nomad running on it, is the perfect time to do these things. Um, build different types of shows. Uh, Ziggy talked about it. Yeah, sorry. Um, you know, if you're doing primarily theater, build yourself uh, some musical stuff. Build yourself, you know, if you're doing straight plays mostly, build yourself a musical start file. Figure out the different tools you have because a lot of that stuff is very portable to different things. Um, you know, I work on a lot of uh, talk shows and news, um, but the stuff that I've learned doing that has helped me figure out how to write macros, how to get that stuff, how to get a base of effects in my show file that translate really well. I love having lots of stuff where people can look at it, comment, tell me how much they hate it, so I can change it before I took a half an hour to make something you don't like. The other thing is, when you're on site, make friends with everybody, except for Nick. <laughs> <laughs> But talk to the talent, talk to management. These are the people who are talking to the band, who are hanging out with those guys. They know what's gonna go on. They're gonna come up to you and say, yeah, we're just gonna do our new usual thing. Well, what does that mean? I don't know what your usual thing is, you do. Uh, if I'm front of house, that mixer, the guy who travels with the band, he knows what's going on. He's gonna go, yeah, they're changing it up. They're gonna slow it way down in a second. Uh, yeah, they're gonna, yeah, they're gonna drop this piece in here. Yeah, they're gonna do this over here, you know. Oh, hold on, the beatbox section comes up. I've never heard that in this song before. I've heard the song 70 times. I was, okay, get ready for it. Um, pay attention. <laughs> Wear your headset. Because they're gonna tell you, the singer's late, the singer's late, we're gonna vamp for 20 minutes. Um, watch the drummer. I can't stress that one enough. Drummers are great for lighting designers. They telegraph everything for you. You know when that hit's coming. If I don't know with the music, I'm gonna watch a percussionist because when those arms go up, the hit's coming down. Um, and read the room. If you see everyone in the audience trying to read a program, give them a little house light. You know, if the vibe isn't right, take the house down. Make it more intimate. You know, if you're not having fun, if you're not doing that, it's not gonna be fun for them. Uh, and then stay organized. You know, you're not, you're not like, don't fight muscle memory. Uh, put things in the same place. Stay organized. You know, if you, if you do these things, I know every time, yes, there's hard keys on the console. Yes, they're duplicated on my magic sheet because I bounce between different places all the time. If my hand's here, I'm not going to want to do this. I'm keeping my hand where it is. I'm not going to move it. You know, big things for me. Um, and lastly here is take care of yourself. Ziggy kind of ended with it, but it's really important, you know. Smell the flowers. <laughs> uh, but if I'm gonna be stuck behind a console at an outdoor festival for 12 hours with the blazing hot sun, make sure you have water. Nobody's gonna come up and deal that with for you, you know. Um, use hearing protection. When audio is doing sound check, they usually check at full volume and there's nobody in the room to absorb that sound except for you. I can't tell you how much in my youth my ears ring now because of this. Um, and I keep in my little kit a bunch of earplugs. Okay, it's dumb, but it makes me happy. Um, and remember to take a break. When you get frustrated, when you can't, you know, deal with Nick putting cats in your presentation, <laughs> take a beat, breathe. It's okay. Walk away. It's okay. I know there's a lot of work to do. You'll come back, you'll get it done. It'll be fine. So let's get some programming tips. So, um, I love the Magic Sheet cue list. I use a Magic Sheet to tell me what, I don't interact with that fader thing on the, on the far left. It's a quick way, I have it set up so it's um, a thousand faders on one Magic Sheet. And it shows me what, oh yeah, on page 85 is something I forgot. So I can quickly look and see it. Um, I love these little quick cue Magic Sheets because I can bounce around, I make quick little things, I bump through them. Um, I, I've said it before, I do the walk-in video podium show a lot, three buttons on a magic sheet versus writing 75 cues to do that when they have one more presentation in the middle. I have a button for it already. You know, I have a blue out look. I have a house button so that if all of a sudden they run into the house, I don't have to worry about where's that, where's that. I have a button that launches me right there and I'm sitting in it. Um, timing, 
Use the console to your advantage here. I have a couple user IDs to switch this. I don't do the elaborate macro that these guys do. I tried it. I got frustrated with it because in the middle of it running, I would have to do something else and interrupt it and it would end. I just switched with the user ID. Um, I'm a queue only user. I'm very proud of that. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy working in queue only. Um, not that I don't understand what tracking is, but I have two users to deal with that. So when I'm, when I'm laying stuff in the first time, I'll stay there in tracking. And then when the show starts, I switch over to queue only. Um, the other thing I make sure is that when there's people in the house, manual time, manual time on everything except for beam for me. Um, I always want my beam to snap, but I want everything else. When the client comes up to me, it's supposed to be blue, it's red, it's supposed to be blue. I'm reacting fast, they're seeing me doing it, but the audience doesn't see that in the look. It, everything just kind of smoothly changes for them. Um, also, it's great to have different assert times, off times, and release time. Um, now with all the new buttons on faders, to be able to take it, exploit this as a feature, it's wonderful. Shift on the console, I love this. I love being able to bounce between two or three cues, verse, chorus, verse, hold that shift button down, disable my timing, know I have timing, maybe it's one second, maybe it's zero seconds. Um, you know, launch a bunch of things in my targets by holding shift and, and hitting those tombstones and then hitting enter so that everything happens at once as opposed to trickling in makes my life super easy. Um, I'm also a big fan of the looping cue list so that when I get to the end, it goes right back around. Um, I try to put, when I do a cue list when I'm busking, uh, as many options in front of me as possible so that if I've got effects running, I don't have to look to try to grab the timing on it. It's all there. It's right at my fingertips. Uh, and consistency. I always know that the third button's solo. I don't have to think about it. It's right there. Um, filtering. Uh, I build, I use filtering in a different way for live. I build up. So I'll have a sub that is my white outlook and the first band of the night, it only does it with some fixtures. And then the next band, I add a couple more. And the next band, I add a couple more. So by the end of the night, when I hit that big white hit, it's really shocking. It, I don't blow it all at the, at the first cue. I kind of build and I don't have to rebuild that content every time. I'm just changing a very little bit of it each time. So while that band is setting up, I go in and I say, okay, yeah, add a couple more channels here, add a couple more channels there. Simple, super simple. There you go, guys. That's what I got. Hello, everybody. Good hang, in there, hang in there, Katie. Good, good programmer, the best sport of all. <laughs> um, thank you, Liz. So uh, uh, we're gonna, I guess, do some Q and A now. Yeah. Um, so I kind of mm -hmm. wanted to start off. You guys are, are professional programmers. You do this all the time. Maybe. Um, but have you guys seen the Patrick Boozer video? Is <laughs> um, that has everybody uh, <laughs> never heard of him? Um, no. Uh, uh, to to sort of start things off, you know, um, I was I was thinking about. Uh, when we were prepping for this, uh, we often have the discussion of, of sort of being able to uh, operate a board versus what a programmer is. Um, and, and I'm interested in hearing what you guys think takes someone who is knowledgeable about a board to a programmer level. Any thoughts on that? I'll go. <laughs> All right. Good, uh, good show, I, think, I think a lot of times being a programmer is not just knowing the features, it's knowing why the feature is there, and when that feature doesn't work, you understand the entire process around why it didn't do what you thought it would do. So it's, it's more than just knowing that the, the desk has this. It's knowing why it has it, and what other ways that you can achieve that same, uh, that same experience with when it doesn't work. Because inevitably, something that you're doing is probably not going to work because of operator error and you need to find a way out of it. So it's like, it's, it's really about knowing why, why, why it exists. Logic is so important. I'd say that's, I would say that somebody who is familiar with the logic, who takes the time and more importantly wants to understand the logic and is willing to go deep in the console and learn that stuff and why it's there, that's what makes a programmer. It's not even someone who already knows that stuff. It's someone who's interested in it 
who wants to learn more about the structure of how it works and wants to use that to their advantage, because you can learn that stuff. You don't have to already know it. You just have to really want to use it. And then you can pick up the other stuff. You can talk to people like us about what we do with the structure. You can talk to ETC about why they built that structure that way. And that's what allows you to do things, you know, big things that, think, that people think of when they think of programmers, like feature requests and bug finding and the stuff that, that happens when you're a programmer happens because you care about the logic. And EOS is a really, really consistent logical console, more so than anything else I've ever worked on. You know what's going to happen when you press that button. You know why. There are no errors. We, we have a phrase in the UK called picnic. Problem in chair, not in console. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a picnic. <laughs> so just, well, just look under the hood and see what's going on. Use your undo menu. Yeah, if you're interested in that stuff, then that's what makes you a programmer. Well, and I guess how, so how do you do that, right? Not, not everybody can just like hop on a rig and start going and hope to learn. Um, how, how do you go about starting to pick up those skills? Um, you know, obviously you can sit in, in your bunny pajamas and, and working offline, uh, but, but how do you prepare yourself to be ready for going out in front of 22 million people or a room full of lighting people? It, basically, a lot of it comes down to experience. You know, you start small. You test yourself, you take jobs that maybe push you a little bit farther. You know, the term trial by fire, I think, is real. You know, uh, just one day you're doing a small regional theater show, the next thing you know, you're doing Super Bowl. You know, and it just, I think, getting there, getting the experience, meeting other people, finding out what they do, and it just, it, I think, yeah, it's really a lot of it has to do with just experience and kind of getting out there and working through some of the issues that you're not going to run through on your couch. You're going to try and figure out why half your dimmer rack doesn't work on site and the generator doesn't work. You know, like it's stuff like that that you just... You know, we yeah. talk to each other as well. Yeah. yeah, don't be afraid to ask questions. Yep. If you don't ask questions, you won't learn. So... Like, my media server programming stuff is still really raw. Like, I have so much video stuff that I'm still refining and trying to find out how... It's so open, media server programming, how you patch your layers, what bits of them you want, what you do with the server itself, how much stuff do you do inside the server, and how much stuff do you do from the EOS end. It's still really new. It's changing all the time. So you've got to talk to your fellow programmers, ask them how they're doing stuff, and try those things out. And there's going to be some there's going to be some commit failure there. <laughs> you're going to fall off that roof, and you're going to. That's the time when you fix the thing. Is actually the mistake is really useful because when you fall off that cliff, you won't fall off that cliff, that particular cliff again. Yep. And I think it's the application of the logic, right? Like touching on both of what both said. It's it's understanding why things are not reacting the way you are, or or how the desk works, but then it's build it, using that to build what you, you know, the tools that you need. We, I think we all at some point in our presentations use the, my toolbox, these tools that I have. And that's kind of the way I look at the desk. It's a tool to get something on stage and you have these tools within that toolbox to help you execute it. Not just, you know, you have palettes and presets and the cue lists and the fader stuff, but there's also, everyone here has talked about macros and we all have crazy macros, but they didn't start crazy. It started, hey, I need to do this little thing. Well, wouldn't it be cool if then it also did this? And then you try it, and well, it doesn't work that way, but if I tweak it this way, okay, cool, now I see how the desk is thinking about it, and I can, they build, and they build, and they build, and they get to these monstrosities that do all these cool things, but they didn't start that way. You know, very rarely do you sit down and you write the perfect macro right out the bat. You know, you, you refine it, and it's, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. unless you're done, maybe you're done. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, you know, so it's, I think it's, yeah, the application of that logic, I think, is, what it's it's the why, not necessarily the how. It's just as important, I think. Yeah, yeah. Do you, no, all good. All good <laughs> uh, well, I, you know, and I, my my curious question then is, uh, uh, what what has been your most spectacular roof fall? Like, what what and and how did you recover? Like, what do you do? And and what do you have? Any, anybody willing to? I'll start. Go easy. go for it. But, uh, uh, there's one moment probably. that sticks out in my head. Um, doing. I think it was the first or second year I was on The Daily Show, and we're in the middle of taping. And I get a call on headset, bring this channel, 
take this channel out. And I know my manual time is set to like five seconds, so I just go to hit out, and instead I hit remdim. Yep. Oh, I've done that. Uh, yep. I've done that. So, and I dumped the studio into complete darkness in the middle of the taping. Uh, <laughs> except for, you know, one light. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it was a key, though, right? Yeah, key. No, no, it wasn't. Uh, so, luckily, uh, John Stewart is a gentleman and a scholar. And he played it off very well. I uh, brought everything back up, heard the director scream for a very long time, and uh, moved on. Uh, Moving on to different roofs uh, now, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. I uh, wow. definitely, before um, the quick save feature was in, um, I definitely opened a show file instead of saving it. Mm. So that was that was pretty sad. Yikes. I think we've all done that. Yeah, yeah. 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 There's no recovery from no. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a high roof. Yeah. yeah, you're you're buying drinks that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, definitely done the remdim one. Remdim and out totally. next to each other. So then 100%. no lights are on, which is good. When you hit remdim out, which no longer yeah. happens. But um, I definitely. So the shift key got stuck once. <laughs> um, <laughs> So you're like, oh, I'm gonna like address, I'm gonna dump something, you know, copy to this sub or whatever, and the sub goes away. You're like, that's weird. <laughs> <laughs> what? Uh, what about this one? And you're like, and before you really kind of like put two and two together, you do the active one that's on stage. So then you like have unmapped the queue that's running the whole stage. So now it's not even just like asserting the queue list. You've just dumped the active queue list that's on stage, and then you know you get the call. Did you did you mean to do that? Like, let's go. So yeah, so that was pretty. That was a pretty glaring. Yeah. That's, that's bad. What do you yeah. think? No, I had uh, <laughs> filtered my entire rig out <laughs> <laughs> for about a half hour. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was a fun time. Uh, uh, I don't think she's in this room right now, but uh, first time I talked to Sasha on the phone. Why? 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 Yeah. Uh, not realizing what was going on. Uh, it was build one three. So, you know, a while ago. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that was uh, immediately going to the lighting designer and go, like, this is what happened. Telling him what happened, you know, admitting it immediately so we could recover. So it's like, how do we get all this stuff back? But yeah, that's a good moment in time. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably three hours of my life I'll never get back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have done all of those things. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, I absolutely hit Remdim when I meant to hit out. I have totally. I've gotten keys stuck. My funniest mess up though was remember on EOS Classic and you had the, the face panel of buttons, right? Mm. I was just putting I was putting them back on because I was leaving the show and I was leaving a show running, so I was putting them back on for people. And I got a fly trapped underneath the direct <laughs> <laughs> And I had, and it wasn't necessarily the weight of the fly, but it was the pressure <laughs> that pressed the buttons. Um, and I had a double go situation that I didn't realize until the fly hit go for me. That, that was <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, not a bug. That 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 They're all undesired features. Yeah. The feature, for sure. <laughs> Moral of the story is don't put those face panels on edges ever. <laughs> oh. oh. Um, do you guys, I, you know, we have like uh, another 20, 30 minutes or so. W what are you guys thinking? What, what do you want to talk about? What do you want to know? These guys are here for you. Uh, how often do you guys like keep in touch? Like, are y'all pretty much always on the go or are you too busy that you rarely catch up? Thank God there's the forums. <laughs> Social media helps a lot. Yeah. 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 Um, but I, I feel like, and I'll, I'll jump in from, from my side. I, I know I communicate with, with all of you and the programmers, you know, like fairly regularly. Um, but you guys are also programming or programming, uh, interacting with each other. And and I think I forget who mentioned it, but you know, trading ideas like the well, I just got off the show that was doing this particular thing. Um, how did you guys handle it last time? So Yeah, and I think a lot of us too, I mean, if you keep up with what's happening in the industry, you kind of pick up on who's doing what. And so when I'm going to go do a show and, A, I haven't worked with someone yet, I know that one of my friends has probably worked with that person. So mm -hmm. I want to contact them and figure out, hey, how was your experience? Did you have fun or should I say no? Or, you know, <laughs> hey, I know you're about to walk into a full rig of, of Magic Blades. How, what's your advice on using Magic Blades? Because mm -hmm. we're, we're just as confused by a lot of those fixtures, too, at some times. So, you know, we're... 
anytime I'm going out on a show, I'm calling someone, but I'm also calling them because they're my friends too. Yeah. So, I mean, we're, we're pretty close. I think, you know, obviously regionally, you guys in New York are talking all the time, but yeah. I'm, I, I'd say that I'm talking to people weekly. Yeah. yeah. I definitely, in, in the UK, the programmer population is pretty small. We're all pretty close together. Um, and I was doing a big, I was doing a big spectacle magic show, and I was doing all the media server programming, and I was not, I was not sure what some of my best practice ways to handle this stuff was. I'd never really worked with live camera feeds as well as pre-recorded video content, so I was wondering how to deal with live camera feeds via like SDI input boxes via EOS, and like what my what my styles were going to be with that. I don't have magic sheets for that. Like I wanted to figure out what I should do with them, and I went down to the national. Um, it's just like the watering hole of programmers in the UK, um, and met with the people there who I had known because we had worked at the same venues before as well, um, and we had all had full-time programming jobs in some of those venues. Meet up at the National Bar, buy somebody a drink, and say, hey, can you help me out? How do you guys do this? And you catch up with them socially and also get some tips and one time, not very long ago, I actually met up with somebody in Heathrow Airport because I was flying out, he was flying in, and I was like, you have just done the Coldplay tour. Come here, talk to me. I've got to find out how you did this thing and programmed this thing. And he was handling that on an MA, so I was nabbing all of his... It doesn't mean you can't talk about how you do stuff. Like, I wanted to hear how he was dealing with these particular tips and tricks and structural things. And so he just met for like half an hour as our flights were crossing over. Very nice. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about taking jobs that, you know, maybe push you past your comfort level, and uh, obviously when you take that, you're going to realize that it's past your comfort level point. So how do you deal with it when you realize that <clears throat> maybe the prep you've done is either isn't enough or the way your magic sheets work aren't quick enough and you're falling behind, and, uh, you know, how do you, how do you recover from something like that? That's what happens. Yeah. Like that's, that's what, you know, it's... it's you have to take jobs that are a little above your skill level because that's the only way you grow. You know, I've never worked with moving lights before. Well, there's a job with three moving lights, perfect. Job with 10 moving lights. And at a certain point, it, there's an, actually an economy of scale that happens. But, um, you know, you, you're like, you, pl you plan all this stuff and you're like, oh, I'm going to nail it because I've made all these magic sheets. And then you get there and you're like, none of this stuff is useful yeah. to me. I spent four hours, you know, in the evening until one in the morning when really, like, getting that sleep probably would have been more beneficial. Um, I mean, and it's just how you learn, and you get through it, and you, you know, like, no job is going to kill you. And, you know, I've, I mean, I don't know, like, I've never, I've never felt like I failed so bad that it was unrecoverable. No, I mean, like, you make mistakes, worse, and you, a lot of times you feel worse than the people yeah. who hired you. Like, a lot of times they don't notice these things that you're like, oh my god, it was like, <laughs> It was terrible. Nothing was palletized. It was awful. It was an <laughs> ugly show file. And they're like, well, I mean, look, yeah. whatever. It looks fine. Yeah, I mean, worst case scenario, the designer's a little bit cranky because he didn't get as much done in the day as you know he wanted to, right? I mean, obviously, don't take a job that is so far out of your comfort level that you just you can't even function, right? I mean, small increments, you know, because at that point, everyone's going to kind of understand that. Sorry, I need to work on this a little bit more. You know, it'll be faster next time. You know, but like, and thank your lucky stars, you're on an EOS at that point. Yeah, because seriously. There are things that that you can get to. Like, if your magic sheets don't work, if the stuff that you made, if you have a target that's out and you've like not targeted your macros to the right range of stuff, your tabs have consistent numbering, so you can always get back to the ones, the ten that you remember that you need. You can always find your stuff. Your button layouts are always going, you're going to have some direct selects. You can just open up a default snapshot zero and mm -hmm. get your basic controls. You can have buttons, you can have fixtures, you can always find stuff. Even if you've not added any of that fancy text database stuff that I do, I can rock up at a console in Sao Paulo tomorrow that I've never seen, and I can lamp everything on that can lamp on, I can see what their buttons are, I can see their queue structures. You can't say that for almost any other console, and by almost I mean any. <laughs> I can't. I wouldn't be able to say that with great confidence. It's sitting down at someone else's console and being able to work it and navigate it, basically. Yeah, thank. Just be happy that you're on an EOS if you fall down and all of your stuff just doesn't work. Speaking of EOS, 
Uh, we're going to use microphones. Sorry, I, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys have talked a lot about music and busking uh, today. Um, if you have a gig where you know you're going to have to be busking on the gig, with all of the consoles available to us in 2017, why choose EOS? I'll take that. Yeah, you want to run? Um, it's purely a comfort level. Like, EOS is capable of doing everything. I mean, there is no limitation to what EOS can do with the new feature sets that we have. You know, 2526 have made music on EOS much easier. Those of us who have done music on EOS for years have built workarounds to do it. Just because I started on an ETC desk, I've worked my way through an ETC desk, I know my way around it. I had content already built, right? So there was no reason for me to go to a different desk. I just figured out a way to do exactly what I wanted. It may have taken a few extra steps, but now it doesn't. So I don't see a reason why I need to go to another desk. If I can do absolutely everything the other guy can do, and sometimes a little bit better, you know, that's, I mean, that's it, really. You know? I think it's about the person in the seat yeah. a lot of times. You know, when you talk about you're, you're renting a console and it comes with an operator or programmer, you're, you're hiring the programmer. You're not hiring the console. Mm -hmm. You're getting, a, you know, a, a bill of goods with that person programming the desk. They're bringing experience. They're bringing their own ideas. And that's not something that the console is going to offer. I mean, yeah, we talk about Clippy in the console all the time. It would be great, but it would be, you know, it's about the person. Yep. There's like a handful of things. Like you can count on one hand the actual literal features that one console has that another console doesn't at, a, at the highest level of programming. There are things that I would narrow down to, uh, to an EOS as someone who does a lot of opera and large scale theater, like color control is a major, major, major deal. Big color fade paths don't exist elsewhere. So if that's the functionality you want, there are some things where you can say, this console has a tool that I as a programmer have to have in order to do this job in the best way. But those things are way, that's way far down the line. Like way sooner in the decision process is, am I good at this? And am I comfortable with the way it works? And I, EOS clicks for me. And like I do loads of work on Cobalt as well. I do tons and tons and tons of Cobalt programming. And I love Cobalt programming. And I use it all the time. And I like to pick the tool that I think is going to do the best job on this show. And that's my Nomad does a lot of work. I've literally taken <laughs> shows. I was, I was doing a dance show in Turkey, and it was raining. It started to rain. And we were at an outdoor arena, and they moved us into an indoor concert hall. And I was like, nope, Cobalt. And just started reprogramming the show because I could do crazy fast like master assignments. And that was important to me in that moment. So as long as it's the right, in the end, we are trying to get a look on stage. We are not trying to do fancy buttons. That's not the goal. That's not anybody's goal. If you are getting the look on stage quickly enough to keep everyone else in the room happy, you've done it right. It, it's about, you know, it's about the, we've reached a point in technology where it's about the programmer. It's not about the hardware anymore. Like, I mean, they can all do more or less the same things. You know, there are, I think we all know other desks as well. And it, we all choose this platform because, you know, it's, as a programmer, I want to use the tools where I'm most comfortable, where I'm fastest, where you know you're hiring me, and if I get to spec a desk, you know it's I want where I can do my best work. So you're getting your money's worth that out of me, um, and the tools are all there. We've reached a point. It's not about the programmer. It's 100% about the desk. And also, I know that like if you know if something goes wrong at 11 o'clock at night, I can get on the phone and call somebody, and they're going to be there. And like that's huge. We had a, I was doing a job in China, and a desk went down, and it was like 3 o'clock in China, but like I feel bad for whoever I woke up here, you know, when I called Madison, but somebody called me back. And like you're out there, and it's your name. Sometimes it's just you on the line. It's you and a console and a designer, maybe, depending on what you're doing, and you have X amount of time to do it. And if something's not working, it could, you know, it could work, not work on any desk. It's, stuff doesn't work sometimes, but I can call somebody, and they can help me. And that, to me, is huge. It's a, it's a backup. So that, that's a large part of it, too, for me. I've always thought if you understand 
you know, what, what you want the DMX to do at the raw of it. Like, lights have stops. You, you have to understand that. You have to understand how lights move. And if you know about what you want to do, you can do it on any surface. But I grew up as an express user. Um, I, don't, I didn't have to think when this desk came out. I just sat down at it. I started typing, and it worked. Um, I've had the same experience like you did. Uh, I've been on the other console, and I've tried to get a question answered, and it was a disaster. And I've been through that situation where you can't get anyone on the phone to support you, you can't figure out how it wants to do it, and nobody's there to help you. And the 3 a.m. phone call is critical. Um, I've had that every job site. Uh, today in class, we've had it. Um, <laughs> And it's what happens when those moments are and how you deal with it. Uh, I don't ever feel on this desk that I'm, let, that I'm alone, that I'm an island. Um, and I always feel like at the worst, I can, turn, I can turn all my magic sheets off, I can turn all the macros off, I can sit there with the command line and I can get the job done. You know, it, might not, it might be me typing faster than I want to in the moment, but I can still get there. And that, that, to me, is the most important thing, is that I get the designer, I get myself the look that I need to get for that show. There's something to be said. Like, across, across the U.S., a lot of us started with expression consoles, and, and we grew up as ETC users. But that's not the case across Europe. And people still choose EOS, even if they don't come from an ETC background. And there are reasons for that. Because of the way the tool is constructed, a really big deal, I think, is that when you're working on an EOS, it feels like you are trying to, to delete steps of translation between a designer and a programmer. I can listen to what a designer is saying, and what I type into the command line is almost the words that they say. Especially the, when I use a lot of queries, so when someone says, oh, I just that backlight's like a little bit rough, I just need to cool it down, I can literally type in backlight cooler. And that is something that I always feel like we're climbing toward on EOS. We are trying to remove more and more of those translation steps in a way that makes the programming super organic. Because the less you have to think about translating, the more you can get done. The more you can dedicate your brain space to thinking about other more complicated, more fun stuff. And that's one of the things that keeps it growing across markets that, that aren't used to the syntax. They still love it because it has some unique features and it really feels like a design-led console. We're not trying to make fancy buttons. We're trying to make the best looks on stage. And I feel like EOS is, is really good at striving for that. I now want t-shirts for all of us that just say fancy button. Fancy button. <laughs> <laughs> Coming to the swag store. Uh, who is up next? Thank you very much. Good question. T-shirt. And then is that thing on? Is it on? No, there we go. Hi. I, my question is actually re related. Um, I, I'm a university professor, so I teach this, and we are an all ETC house. So um, I wonder if you think it's a limitation to have only worked on one series of desks. I think it's definitely a hindrance if you don't know what other people are doing. Um, as a trainer, as somebody who works in this business, I make it my job to know what else is out there and, t and touch things and see it. Um, doesn't mean I do full shows on them, but I definitely pay attention. Um, it's how I then beat up on these guys to say, hey, I want this. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are some good ideas out there. It's Like I said earlier, it's good to recognize a great idea. It's even more important to recognize a bad idea and understand why. Um, I was on a desk that doesn't have a screen on it. You know, why is that difficult to operate? Um, you know, why, why is only having this tiny little LCD screen not going to work for my workflow? Yes, it's great to have all the magic sheets, but even when you don't have that, I still want to see my data. I still want to see what queue I'm in. I don't want to have to, in the heat of battle, try to squint and see a three-line LCD screen or have to try to then invent a screen and make options happen to see a queue list. I just want to be able to hold tab, hit one, and see it, and know it's there, and see I'm in Q7. Um, but to understand how other things worked, how, you know, you go, oh, that's cool how they do that. 
well, I can't do that, but I can write a thing, I can write an effect, I can figure out, I can deconstruct it and then make and figure out how to do that on my console. So it's good, it's, you know, it's important to know. I think if you really seriously want to become a programmer and you're really looking for this as a career, you're doing yourself a disservice by not investigating the other desks because my brain works EOS, right? Every other console speaks a different language. If all of a sudden you get onto another desk and it's the right language for you, you're doing yourself a disservice by not digging into it a little more. Um, you know, I love this desk. I wouldn't go somewhere else, but that's me, you know? So, uh, and you gotta yeah, keep honestly, investigating that thing as well. You do, yeah. I People mean, release new features and, you know, you wouldn't be able to grow if you weren't looking at what you were maybe missing. Yeah. So I think you, you do yourself a disservice by not investigating it. Mm -hmm. You don't do yourself a disservice by like not dedicating a bunch of your time to go, or, and money going to training courses and trying to get really good at it. That, skipping that stuff doesn't do you a disservice. But you should, when someone, go to a trade show. Like if someone's releasing new features, go up and try it. You may think this still sucks. But it, it may be like, oh, that's cool. I wonder if we could like talk to Anne about why we don't do this thing. <laughs> you, can, you can find those things and that's how we all grow. So the only disservice is not looking at it. Mm -hmm. I think knowing, I mean, you know, pro, you know, being programmers is applying you know, logic and, and being able to look at something and troubleshoot and put together these tools. You know, I don't, I don't think you should limit yourselves to a desk for the right or the wrong reason. And I think it happens for both, right? You know, I use X desk be best because it is the only desk that can do this, this, and this. Or it is the, it, you know, it's just what everybody uses for this, this, you know, and you could go either way, right? Broadway or touring or whatever, they have, they each have their own desk, which is kind of, I think, a outdated idea. Um, but, you know, like a lot of desks, you know, do things, they do, they do things differently, it's different approaches. And those are all portable to each other, every other desk. You know, as Ziggy said, there are very few features that one desk has that another, you know, doesn't. But you may not have thought of approaching it that way, but you go on another desk and you're like, oh, hey, like it thinks of it like this. I could totally do that over here. And I just never would have thought of it because that's not the native language that this speaks, but it totally can do it. And now I've taken this, you know, I've taken this idea from another desk and I'm applying it on this tool that I know really well. And I think that's even more powerful. So I think like knowing or being familiar, or at least exposing yourself to other desks is important. Um, but I think that at the end of the day, this is the tool, you know, that I'm most comfortable on, that I know, you know, is growing in great directions. And, you know, I think if you're on a tool that fits you, you'll stay with that tool. But I, I don't think you should put blinders on and, and limit yourself to only one thing because you think it's the right thing to do one way or the other. And Josh, you're an educator. What, yeah, where, I, where are you at? I would love to say that you should have as much diversity in the product portfolio at your university as you can have. But obviously there's a dollar amount that's associated with that. So I think you have to pick the products that you think are maybe the most relative to your students or the most relative to the industry that you want them to go in when they leave your institution. Um, obviously, you know, now with ETC and high end, you have two really great options for two completely different spectrums. So the, the really great thing about that is now you have an opportunity for that great support that ETC is known for from another company. So I do think that you know, there's options that are out there and you should absolutely investigate those options, but do it slow. Because the worst thing is when you put all of your money into this new console that you think that you should get and then it just sits there and no one touches it. And remember that as the professor, as the educator, it's your responsibility to learn it as well. You, know, you can't expect the students to learn that product because when they graduate, no one knows it. So I mean, you have to take the classes, you have to educate yourself. And by doing that, hopefully that motivates the students to do it with you. Well, and I'll, I'll add on top of that, you know, this has come up throughout this, you know, I, I think also uh, fully understanding the theory and teaching that as well, you know, desk to desk, manufacturer to manufacturer, um, 
there are only so many choices you can make in, in coming up with a control platform, right? So uh, Anne and Sarah uh, Clausen from, from ETC uh, a couple of years ago now wrote a white paper that was just about the theory of, of desk operation. You know, what are the choices that you make uh, to handle things like playback, how data is stored, um, things like that. And, and there are a finite number of choices that you can make in the creation of a product uh, for controls. So understanding what those choices are and understanding the different options, I think, allows you to evaluate those products uh, better and understand them. And, and then it's all about the feels, right? Where, where, where do I feel good? What, what platform do I feel good on? So, um, the, thank there's you. growth, though, as well, I think. Like the EOS is, expands into features from the other consoles. So when you, when you find something that's working really well and you think this is great for live music, there's a lot of support and growth in people finding those features, bringing them together and trying to explore them. It doesn't, it doesn't always feel that way in other directions. It doesn't feel like people are looking at features that EOS is really, really great at and trying to incorporate them really well. So we do a lot of great expansion in that direction. Thank you. Microphone? Yeah, hi. Um, I was wondering if, if you guys could, oh, hello, there we go. Um, how many years have each of you been in this industry, if you mind? <laughs> we'll start with Ziggy. Oh. <laughs> uh, so I, I mean, I started, I, I started going to an arts high school um, when I was 13, and I started programming on an express straight away. Um, so, and I've, that's the only job I have ever done was lighting since that moment. I've never, literally never done anything else in my whole life. Um, but I'm also 27, and there are only so many jobs you can take like when you're, you know, under 18. So I, I mean, I've been working legally for, <laughs> for like nine years. Uh, professionally, I've done it for 11. Uh, let's see. 12? 12 years? I didn't touch a digital console till I got to college. I started actually in film, and then I kind of fell into this. So um, probably as a programmer, probably eight or nine years. Other film stuff before that. I'm embarrassed. 16 what, years? What yeah. I'm, I mean, professionally, I've been working in this industry for 16 years now. Yeah. I, uh, I started picking up yeah. the, the little gigs, the, the, the get better gigs, like mm -hmm. in high school. Um, and, and then yeah. professionally, 12 years. And I keep turning 30, so. <laughs> yeah. Luckily, that'll stay. Yeah. Yeah. Perpetual. So, yeah. I, but, I, but I think this Quite sort different. of, you know, there's, <laughs> you start incrementally, right? The, these things take time. You, you start with something. Um, you're comfortable with, which, which may be nothing or little, um, and, and it takes time to grow and, and, and sort of step up to the next place and the next place and the next place. Um, but it feels like it happens fast. I think relative to other industries, that is pretty, pretty fast, yeah. actually. I mean, I think it's like, it's, if it's something you're passionate about, you know, I mean, those, if, man. We just had like the nerdiest conversations when we talk to each other. It's, it's, I mean, <laughs> but I mean, I mean, all of us are really passionate about it, and we talk and we discuss and we argue about the way stuff should work. It's because like we think about this stuff. All, I mean, all the time. I mean, I have my laptop open at home, and for fun, I'm working on my show file or whatever. Or we'll get together at a barbecue, and we'll just like talk about. What would happen if you had this and this? And maybe Josh doesn't, but <laughs> Josh is shaking his head in disappointment. But like you know, a lot of us we talk about it, so it's you know, it's yeah, maybe it's eight or nine years, but I think that time frame is compressed when you're just when you're passionate about something, you're always thinking about it and wanting to make yourself better and the product better, and it's this two-way communication yeah. with a company that you know you're using their products and they're making you better and you're making them better, and it's just like it's so it's this condensed time I think that helps you grow faster in this, this industry, I find. And this has been awesome. Yeah. Like, we've had, it, we've had reasons to talk that I'm in a completely different country. I don't get to talk to you guys. And like collaborating on this chat even, like we've all been talking to each other a lot and we have picked up like 50 macros each. Yeah. <laughs> like really That's, cool. Really and so dope. many sites to find cat memes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean like macro cat is coming. Macro cat's sure. coming. Macro yeah. cat. Macro cat. Macro cat's coming. Uh, thanks. Uh, who is the mic? Hey. 
music therapy has matured as a field of study, a career, and medical science has uh, shown its effectiveness. Is light therapy uh, in the future, or are all the benefits just behind the desk? I just work here. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where's Wendy? I actually. Yeah, where's, where's Wendy? Uh, if you haven't gone into Wendy's magical tent yet, um, yeah. she's doing color research. Uh, you know, from I, I, I guess I don't know how to really answer that. We're. I actually have. I have uh, what some are you seeing out there? Like, yeah. Because of all the weird stuff I do, I end up I end up doing a lot of um, like research stuff. So I work with a lot of universities that are doing uh, research studies. I finished a project called Heart in Your Hands, um, and I was actually using cobalt UDP stuff uh, to get heart rates from heart rate monitors via Bluetooth and then translating that into DMX stuff um, and trying to see what like seeing heart rates does in light, um, turns out it's actually like mega distracting. <laughs> but it's <laughs> how the cookie crumbles. Um, but it's, we, sometimes I'm part of projects that, that try stuff out like that. And one of the things that, that I'm involved with currently is we're, we're trying to figure out how to uh, make lighting design for people who can't necessarily see light or see very much light. Uh, so we're trying to figure out how to like notate lighting design and sign it um, mm -hmm. and how to translate it into other forms like uh, vibration data and stuff like that. And I think there's, a, there's an enormous amount of potential for light therapy in medical science and for creative programming and creative coding of that stuff to optimize the processes for that therapy. I think there's a, a huge amount of potential in creating some tools for sensory perception lighting and in using sensory balanced lighting in special education and in uh, therapeutic environments for adults and children. So there's, there's loads of potential, but there's not a whole lot of research as far as I know. There's not tons of actively funded research going into that. So it's not that it's not there, it's that it's tough to get get the cash for that kind of thing. Are you guys working on any other projects that sort of relate to health or? I work in TV, so I don't know, maybe it's the opposite. <laughs> it's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> I think I filled in on Dr. Oz at some point. No, there you go. <laughs> yeah, that's good. No, but I, I, it's an interesting question because I, I, you know, I think there is, in the past five or six years, um, we've seen an acknowledgement of light from non-lighting people um, that I find really interesting and and you know you see things with with technologies like day shift on phones um, and and these sorts of experiments with uh, with people for for medical reasons um, so I, I think there's a lot of potential in the future of stuff that that could come and and all of those things need the technical people to operate them so that's good for us I think uh, thank you uh, hey um Ziggy made a couple references uh, to lights as objects, not numbers. That thing behind the door, the backlight. Do you find as EOS is, is becoming more object-oriented that designers are thinking less in terms of channel numbers and more in terms of objects? I encourage my designers to talk to me, not tell me channel numbers as much as possible. Because I find it's quicker for myself to access things and get what they're actually trying to get to versus them trying to call out 75 numbers to grab all the side lights. I need it to be blue from here. It's much quicker to communicate. Um, we talk about it when we talk about color. You know, when I say R27, that tells you so much information, right? So if they tell me I want it to look like R27 on stage, I know what that means, I know what the vibe is, and I can do that much quicker than if you're trying to then sculpt it and make it happen. Because as it's happening, you're going to get frustrated. Oh, that's still blue. Oh, you're not. Oh, and I'm trying to catch up to you. You just tell me what you want. You talk like people, and I'm able to deliver a product much more close to what you're thinking about. Because even if they know the console, your tools aren't the same. So they might be calling yeah. out keystrokes to you that are just not applicable to the way your stuff is organized, and it can get really frustrating. And it's, it's location-based as well, like geographically um, across Europe. It's very, very rare for designers to ask for really specific numbering structures. 
um, it's much more common in the States for, for designers to, to talk more specifically. And I noticed that when I program for American designers in the UK, like a funny shift happens where they start talking in, in syntax and I'm like, no. <laughs> we, like, we, can, we can be way faster about this. And it might take a while, but a lot of the time, if, if you can sort of be gentle about encouraging and, and getting people to ask for things in the object-oriented way, it's almost always faster if your tools are set up like that. And I find that most of the people I program for, if they don't start that way, they end up that way by the end of it. Because you start to trust each other. The designer can say, yeah, that backlight is just a little hot. Can you cool it off for me? That, that front light is just a bit sharp. Can we soften it out? And you develop a language over the course of that time. And so it's, I hope that it ends up object-oriented. And it's even better if it starts out that way. And I think it's, it's tending that way. Because there's also too many numbers for people to remember now. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah. like when I'm doing, you know, the key lights, backs, and fills, and stuff like that, my designers are still talking to me in channels, right? But when I have a set that has 3,000 LEDs in it, we're talking, I'm coordinating with them to label my groups to whatever they want. That little white strip behind the desk, what, what do you want to call that? Do you want to call that the credenza? Do you want to call it this? And whatever they tell me, I'll label. And then when they call it something completely different for the next 20 times, I'm going to relabel the group. <laughs> you know, but, it's a, uh, but that's how I go about it. You know, uh, in studios, it's really the set stuff for me is labeled yeah. whatever they want to call it. Also, subs. For me, I have 12 different stand-up positions and then probably five variations on each of those, depending on camera angles. So, you know, you may say, OK, we're going to Zen. And it's going to be the one coming down the stairs, and it's going to be this. And I label that cue list that, because that's what he's going to call later. It's not going to be position 14A, which is what it says on the magic sheet. Yeah. Right. I think as we move more and encourage designers to go away from the idea of having to call out channels, it, and, and as they experience that, like Zicky was saying, I think what they find is that they're able to actually approach their design from a far more creative aspect than before because they don't have to worry about what's happening in the screens. They can focus on the stage and painting that stage. The worst is when they're trying to call the syntax, they're trying to look in the monitors, and they're just not noticing that everything, they're missing the entire scene being reblocked. So if as much of that that we can take off of them, that burden, I think they end up with a better product. Well, and to put a final point on that, I think that goes back to Lewis's presentation about you know, needing to be uh, an artist as well as a programmer, yeah. right? You know, to, to support designers in that way, um, you, you need to have an artistic sense and, and immersing yourself gets you there. So mm -hmm. um, uh, We have uh, time for just another question, one more. And... Um, evaluating other people's work, how do you critique it to yourself? What makes you happy and what makes you unhappy when you're looking at other people's stuff? <laughs> well, part of it for me is what is the audience getting out of it? You know, it's not so much about how, like, if it, if there's a warm look on stage and there's a warm vibe to the music coming out and it all is cohesive and... I don't enjoy it, but 90% of the audience does. It makes me question why I don't enjoy it, and it makes me sometimes fight my natural instinct to try to go kind of against myself, but to be pleasant to everyone else. Um, I really try to feel like I try to pay attention more to what's what you guys are see, what you guys are reacting to. You know, it's not so much that you notice that it changed to warm. It's that all of a sudden everybody started moving. And why did they start, why did everybody start dancing? Why did everybody start reacting to the music? Oh, because the lighting traveled into the house. And that's an idea to steal. <laughs> I mean, I think I, as a music producer I worked with once, I said, give the song what it wants. You know, like there's something that all of these pieces they want, they're asking for. And when I'm, you know, if I'm looking at somebody else's work, which I'm not sure, quite sure if that's your question or if it's our own work, but. Like, I, you know, is it, you know, I got in this from filmmaking. It's like the vector I took. It took a sharp right turn at the Express and never looked back. But, <laughs> um, 
you know, I got into it because I like telling stories and I liked being expressive and helping people tell their stories. And is what I'm seeing, whether it's music or it's a show, is it, is it adding to the experience or is it subtracting from the experience? You know, if I walk out of something and I say, the lighting was amazing, but I don't remember anything else about the show, maybe the designer overdid it. And it could be amazing, or maybe the show was really bad, but, you know, it's... <laughs> You know, I, my, I always feel like my job is to be additive to an experience and not subtractive. And it's not about me, it's about supporting the experience. Um, so when I look at my work, or I look at other people's work, I want to be a part of something bigger. I don't want to be the thing that people remember because that's not what, it, that's not what it's about, you know? know. Uh, I'd say I try to go in with a really open mind and remind myself that I shouldn't be critical because I'm there to be entertained no matter what. That's why you're there. So the minute that I'm like, start to look up in the room and like, look at the lighting rig, I'm like, focus, focus, focus. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I get so easily distracted because I'm going, ah, oh, I wonder how they're doing that right now. And then it's like, no, there's people on stage. You respect the art, respect mm -hmm. it. So, you know, it's, I don't think I don't think it's fair to be too critical of any of it and and go oh well you know they missed like seven hits of music there they could have oh they had that one moment that they missed because maybe that maybe the music changed after the lighting designer left and they didn't even know about it right it, there's so many there's so many um, reasons for stuff to happen and you don't know why it's there enjoy the moment you want to take it on all the way around the bend sure. Uh... <laughs> For me, music is easier for me to go and enjoy, uh, just as an experience. Watching TV for me is sometimes painful, and I just can't do it. I'm overly sensitive at this point in my life and career to, to shadows and skin tone and color temperature and things like that, that I, I honestly just can't get over at a point. And I'll have to turn the TV off or change the channel because it's just, I can't concentrate on the content. I'm looking at why is that dude have a face? The opposite of Josh. <laughs> right? And it just bothers me. But when I'm going to see a concert or something like that, I can honestly, I don't know if it's the, the heavy bass or whatever, you know, the mm -hmm. feeling of being there, that's incredibly enjoyable to me. And occasionally I'll look up and be like, that was freaking cool. All right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So yeah, um, no discrete times, no soft blocks, no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like you could. You, I mean, you can critique a show file and the and the technical programming of the show file all day long, um, and you could talk about why I like to use parts instead of discrete times, and why I like to make sure my blockouts, my only blackouts, are asserted. Um, but if if the show happened and it looked good, we've all said it. The show happened and it looked good. You did it right. Like there, there will be things that you want to do differently the next time. There will be things that you think you can improve that'll make you faster doing it. But we, we're not, you know, we're not here to like look over your show file and tell you that it's wrong in all these ways. We can tell you how we would do it differently and how we might do it faster. But that's that's all we can do, really. There's like there's same things that are different. You no, know, when I watch TV, like. I spend my life, when I'm working for NBC, I spend my life trying to like get rid of shadows. But the American look is really different from like European television look. Oh, yeah. And that's like shadows all over the place on European television. Specific shadows. Spe really specific <laughs> shadows. Um, and they're, those are important in different places. Wherever you go, there's going to be stuff that's different. And the important thing is that you can change your workflow to match the look that you need to get. So if after a bunch of time you develop these show files that are like, this is perfect, this is great, I've got all the macros I need, this is brilliant, you might rock up somewhere tomorrow that, that you can't do any of that stuff in. And the, the mark of a good show file is that you were able to adapt your stuff to get that look quick. And I think that's something that's common with all EOS programmers. We really like EOS because it's more about the end it's getting that look on stage with the least amount of translation. And that's probably one of the reasons we're all here and our EOS programmers is because that's our style. <laughs> Very good. Well, uh, a perfect way to end it, I think. Thanks, guys, for hanging out with us tonight so late. These guys, thank you. Um, thanks.